And I want to thank all those in attendance uh, this Wednesday evening. We are in a study of the book of Romans. And it's a very intriguing study, but it's also one that, that requires intense study, where it is probably one of the most uh, complicated books to uh, comprehend. Kind of like old, old age, it's not for the weak. <clears throat> uh, we start this week with uh, Romans, the fourth chapter, verse four. Uh, but before we do, though, let's have a short word of prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we are blessed to be able to engage in this study of thy word. And we're grateful for the word that thou hast uh, uh, given to us and has been preserved for us to study and for all those who in their own personal studies and have made uh, their knowledge known to us that we not, may not uh, may also gain from them. We're grateful for our savior of whom the scriptures speak, who is our hope and our salvation. We pray this prayer in his name, amen. It uh, begins in verse four. Now to him, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but death, a debt. And I, think, I think we all understand this. If one relies on his own works of merit, uh, then whatever such, such works earn him is not counted as grace, but as a payment of wages. This is contrary to the whole principle of uh, justification by grace. Therefore, it may be said that whoever keeps the law perfectly, he can demand his wages as a debt owed him. It may be said that the job description demands perfection. And if a man does not achieve perfection, he cannot demand his wages or he has violated the terms of his employment. And if he violates the terms of his employment, he is owed nothing. In verse uh, uh, five of chapter four, but to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. <clears throat> Now, work in verse 5 is the same as works in verse 4. Paul is saying that he who does not depend on works of merit for justification, but on faith, which are results in works of obedience, then his faith is put to his account as justification. Faith only advocates would argue that to become a Christian, one must be justified by faith only so that it may be by grace, since work is in opposition to faith. <clears throat> Jesus' words in John 6, chapter verse 29, say that this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. It is not a work that God does, but it is a work established by God for man to do. It is specious reasoning to assert that there are no acts of obedience of course, uh, they would classify them, those uh, faith only the people would classify them as acts of merit. <clears throat> there are no acts of obedience that man must do to secure justification. It works of any sort destroys grace, then how may grace be extended to the Christian living a life of faith? Grace is an integral part of every command of God. To uh, argue otherwise is a conundrum that the faith only adheres cannot hopefully uh, logically resolve. Verse six, Justice David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. In verse uh, the 32nd Psalm, verses one and two, it reads there, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, uh, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. 
and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Works include the totality of the works that, a, that man must do in keeping all perfectly. Man cannot justify himself, but only God can do that. A man who through an obedient faith is forgiven by God that is justified, such a man is blessed. It is erroneously asserted by some that is the righteousness of Jesus that is imputed or credited to man. And if that were the case, that would grant to someone something he does not have or more than he currently has. Such a doctrine is totally without scriptural support. If it is Christ's righteousness uh, that is imputed to man, then it must be the case that another man's sin is imputed to man. We'll get in that verse eight below. It is the soul that sins that shall die, Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, verse four and verse uh, 20. To aver the one is to aver the other. In uh, verse seven of chapter four, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. If deeds do not matter, <clears throat> then what has been being forgiven here? It is deeds that violate the will of heaven. Favored by God are those who have transgressed his law but are forgiven and whose sins are washed away by the blood of Christ. <clears throat> In verse eight, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. God will not impute sin to a forgiven man. A forgiven man is one who through faith has obeyed the gospel of Christ. The gospel is God's power to save, Romans 1.16. It is the cleansing process prescribed in the gospel that results in the justification of man and wipes away his sin. Once a man's sins are washed away, there are no sins remaining to impute to him. Verse 9, does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. <clears throat> the blessedness is the remission of sins. That, that is to be justified. Is it only the Jews who can have sin permitted? They thought only the Gentiles were sin, uh, sinful. The answer to Paul's question is that forgiveness of sins is available to and needed by both Jews and Gentiles. Paul reasons from the case of Abraham, which the Jew considered to be their father in the faith, the Jew would agree that it was Abraham's obedient faith that justified him. So Paul asked in verse 10, how then was it accounted while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. <clears throat> if Abraham was justified by faith, then when did that happen? Abraham never lived in the law of Moses. Therefore, the promises were given to him, and it was accounted to him for righteousness before the rite of circumcision was inaugurated, a rite that the Jews were seeking to impose on the Gentiles as a matter of justification. Verse 11, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. So the faith for which he was credited, <clears throat> he had before circumcision. It was thereafter that he received the sign of circ uh, circumcision, a seal of the righteousness he had before circumcision. This then makes him the father of all those who believe, Jew and Gentile. Circumcision now counted for nothing. 
Of course, since the Abraham circumcision was a sign and a seal, if he had refused it, uh, his circumcision would not have uh, would not have been an obedient faith, nor could he have been the father of the faithful. In verse 12, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had received while still uncircumcised. Abraham is more than merely uh, the father of those who are of the circumcision, that is the, the Jews, but also to those that is the Gentiles who walk in the faith that Abraham had before he initiated the rite of circumcision. He was a father in flesh to the Jews, but a spiritual father to those of the faith, which includes the Gentiles. <clears throat> In verse 13, <clears throat> for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through, <clears throat> uh, might add that uh, through the, uh, the the is not in the Greek. So it, it, it was just the Greek would read through law, but here it reads through the law. But uh, through the, and the again is not in the Greek, so it could read the through righteousness of faith. Abraham did not receive the promise through law. That is, the promise was not given to him because he perfectly kept any law. Under consideration here cannot be the land promise given to Abraham, for it says here that he would be heir of the world. <clears throat> Paul did not have in mind the land promise. <clears throat> God promised Abraham that through him all the families of the earth would be blessed. A reference to Christ in Genesis, the 12th chapter, verse 1 and 3. In a physical sense, Abraham was not the father of a multitude of nations. In a spiritual sense, he was. <clears throat> The seed that Paul has in mind is the is the Christ. In Galatians, the third chapter, verse 16, we read, Now to Abraham and his seed, where the promise is made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. Verse 14, for if those who are of thee, and again, thee is not in the Greek, so we could say for those who are not of law, uh, are heirs, faith is made void, and the promises, and the promise made of no effect. If law alone makes one an heir, then there is no need of faith, and the promise to Abraham means nothing. Christ is the heir of all things, and it is faith in him that the promise is fulfilled. In Hebrews, the first uh, uh, chapter, verses one and two, says there, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these latter days spoken to us by his son, <clears throat> whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. In the 15th verse of chapter 4 of Romans, it said, Because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. <clears throat> A pure law system can only bring wrath. That is, it can only condemn. If there were no law, then there would be no transgression. But there is transgression. So there is law which only brings about wrath. So there must be something better than a pure law system. And we'll talk about law uh, later in uh, chapter seven, or chapter eight, seven, eight, somewhere in there. <clears throat> in verse 16, therefore it is a faith that it may be according to grace <clears throat> so that the promise may be sure to all the seed and the seed of those who believe. <clears throat> 
not only to those who are the, are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So what is of, of faith? Well, it's the promise. It had to be by faith or it could not be according to grace. The uh, promised inheritance of the world, uh, back to verse 13, is by faith. The inheritance is to be realized or made sure by faith. Neither is through law. If the inheritance depended on law, <clears throat> no one could ever attain it since all fail in obedience to law. It must, therefore, be a matter of grace to those who are of the faith of Abraham. Verse 17, <clears throat> as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. And you can uh, refer to Genesis, the 17th chapter, verse 5, where that is uh, promise is made. Made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead. <clears throat> might say when Isaac was born, uh, Abraham and Sarah was as good as dead as far as uh, procreating. He said, he gives life to the dead and who calls those things which do not exist as though they did. God uh, promised things that were only to be realized later. But he could speak of them as if, as if they existed. Abraham is the father of many nations, even those not yet in existence. He is both a physical father and a spiritual father. He is the father of all, even in the presence of or before him, uh, whom he believed. All preceded the law of Moses, so dear to the Judaizers. So this all happened before the law of Moses came into effect. <clears throat> verse 18, uh, continuing uh, verse 17, who, contrary to hope, and the hope is based on some reasonable basis or some reasonable ground, contrary to hope, in hope, <clears throat> uh, both, uh, based solely on the promise of God, who, contrary to hope, in hope, believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. The promise was made through Sarah, who is barren. <clears throat> she gave her handmaiden, Hagar, to Abraham to conceive the son, a son of promise. Thus Ishmael was born. But God said that the son of promise would come through Sarah. So Abraham believed and acted accordingly. In verse 19, <clears throat> and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Abraham was not weak in faith, even though his body and Sarah's were past the age of procreation. From the perspective of procreation, they were as good as dead. He did not let that <clears throat> or their age influence him. Uh, verse 20, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. God promised Abraham a countless posterity. At the time, however, his body and that of Sarah's were as good as dead for purposes of procreation. Abraham had a decision to make. <clears throat> did he believe God against nature? Or did he believe nature against God? But he was motivated and animated by faith and acted accordingly, thereby, thereby giving glory, uh, God the glory. <clears throat> In verse 21, a continuation of verse 20, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he, of course, the he's or God, 
and, and he was also able to perform. <clears throat> so being fully convinced is a result of being strengthened in faith. There was no unbelief in Abraham, and therefore he acted accordingly. By such action on the basis of faith in the promises, in the promise of God, of God, his faith became even stronger. He honored God in all that he did, especially when in being fully convinced that all God promised, in all that God promised, however improbable it might seem to others, God would do. To give glory to God is to ascribe to him all that is due him and, of course, to obey him in all things. In verse 22, <clears throat> and it was accounted to him for righteousness. All the things about Abraham that, was, uh, that has just been described had motivated his conduct was put to his account for righteousness. <clears throat> This was not merely a mental state, but was attended by action. The internal conviction led to an external action. The conviction that all God says is true and that all his promises will be fulfilled will strengthen the inner man, induce him to do whatever God commands, and lead him to obey despite obstacles. <clears throat> Belief is perfected by acts. When Abraham did that, it was accounted to him for righteousness. <clears throat> Verse 23, now it, it was not written for his sake that it was imputed to him. <clears throat> Although these things were written for Abraham's uh, sake, it was written for ours as well. <clears throat> in verse 24, but also for us, it shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. As uh, Paul penned these words, no doubt he had in mind all those who would read his message down through the centuries. Do we have faith in God as did Abraham? Will we act on that faith? If so, righteousness will be imputed to us as it was to Abraham. <clears throat> because of our justification. It's always been the heavenly plan that Jesus would have to be offered up to effect the salvation of man from his sins. True man was the consummating hand that accomplished the crucifixion of Jesus. But this was the original will of God that permitted it. It was our offenses that necessitated a sacrifice. Sin could not be remitted without a blood sacrifice. If no one sinned, no blood sacrifice was needed. It was his resurrection that permitted him to enter the heavenly most holy place and offer his blood and ransom for man. <clears throat> it is written in, in 1 Corinthians 15, chapter verse 17, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Our justification is now dependent on our belief and our obedience motivated by that belief. So we'll conclude there and begin chapter five next week.